Okay. Good. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Amandine Doliva Dolansky. I'm a postdoc at Tempa University and the College. And today I was volunteered to uh, present and summarize the numerous very interesting discussions that we had uh, in the Milky Way and Stellar Population Breakout Session. So, um, first of all, the first day, uh, we actually talk about how to incorporate machine learning um, in this new big data era uh, in order to reduce the number of uh, face positive, to explore and discover new uh, interesting objects, uh, but also how can we incorporate the knowledge domain, the domain knowledge, sorry, <laughs> into this machine learning. Um, and so people came up with a few ideas. I think the first one was interest in latent variables in how can we use them to uh, have a sense, have a physical intuition of what is going on with machine learning? How can we basically harness them to obtain the answer we need? Um, another one was the use of supervised uh, simulation uh, in order to um, incorporate the domain knowledge and also make that resonate with unsupervised simulation so that we could uh, learn from those both type of um, approach in machine learning. Uh, I think it was really highlighted the power of machine learning to emulate simulation because from a few sample of uh, high resolution simulation, you can uh, create a big number of them. And this will be particularly important in this era where we will want to uh, compare simulation and observation. Um, Okay, also, uh, it was uh, said that we had to be very careful with how we deal with the noise. Uh, the machine learning that we use should be robust against the noise, and it was uh, made clear that there is a difference between images and catalog, right? The closer you are to uh, what has been observed, the better you understand the noise. And so machine learning can be a uh, help to better understand this. And finally, I think it's really resonates with what had been said before too. Uh, there is a need for more uh, person in machine learning, but there is also a need with uh, education. And so uh, people talked about the lack of uh, classes and uh, knowledge of uh, to educate grad students or undergrad students on those um, tools because it has been said that uh, physicists care more about physics than the tools, so they prefer to teach that, but uh, it's actually pretty important to give those tools to uh, new graduates or undergraduate students. Okay, um, then the following session has been started with a great uh, um, tutorial session about how to use the Noir Lab uh, source catalog data. Um, I just wanna say it's a great catalog and actually uh, the Jupyter Notebook full of example on how to use this is in the Slack channel. So if you can take a look, it's, it will be useful for numerous things. And actually it sparked some conversation around it during the second half of uh, this um, breakout session. So a lot of question has been asked if those kind of platform would be transferable to LSST because having uh, such an access to catalog uh, quite easily um, would be great to be able to harness the power of those large survey. Um, and also it has been said that this catalog had been underutilized because a lot of people don't know about it or uh, about the power that it can have. So if you want to take a look, please, it's great. <laughs> um, uh, finally, yeah, people were very excited after this tutorial about all the discoveries that you can do, the use of proper machine, but also time variable science. Like there is very a big um, science, big science question that can be explored thanks to this. Um, then we, we went to actually talk about some more challenging thing um, with those type of data, which are, for example, star galaxy separation in uh, faint, the faint age of stars but also how to use the quality flags from the catalog in order to first filtrate your data, but also to try to find the different anomalies that we are looking for. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, um, yeah, so it was asked if uh, some collaboration or some, um, um, if it was possible to add, for example, LSST data to this 
uh, platform. And of course, it raises the question about funding and collaboration that I think already was touched upon in the last few summaries. Um, and the session actually ended with a call for a Noah Lab catalog uh, egg day session over Zoom. So I'm just passing along the call. <laughs> Okay, so now in the um, third breakout room, we started the conversation about follow-up. I think it's a question that is very uh, important in this era of big data because we will have a lot of big discovery and the need for follow-up would be clearly bigger than uh, the resources that we have. And the question was, first, what do you follow? So you have two types of follow-up, either follow-up of a sample or follow-up of a rare gen that is isolated. And in case of a sample, most often than not, you can actually determine the number of uh, objects that you need to confirm this, your science question. So those are some things, some statistics that needs to be into um, your proposal. But in case of a rare gem, it's more of a high risk, high reward thing, right? And so in those cases, you can't actually predict uh, the number of targets that you need. So there is really different way you can go at it and it's hard to, um, share the time between both of those. Uh, people, I think, at the end said that in this era of big data, we'll have a big homogeneous, homogeneous survey. Um, and so it will lead to a lot of uh, population discovery that are discovered the same way, and so in a uniform way. And so maybe we should get away from trying to understand precisely uh, one object, but more think about population. Um, yes, and then it was clear that uh, there will be problems and oversubscription with uh, spectroscopic follow-up uh, for different sub uh, science cases, uh, because a lot of them actually require, uh, require a big precision. So for example, 10 meter class telescope. Uh, but it was said that there's also cases where you can find cheaper alternative. And so people talked about a narrow band photometry to obtain metallicity, for example. Um, it was also brought up that we should not forget that some follow-up uh, needs timing and other don't. So we can be flexible in, in function of that too. Um, and finally, it's also raised a question of equity because most of the people that would be able to access those follow-up will uh, be people in institutes that have proprietary access to those big telescopes. And so it raised the question of how can we um, make those follow-ups uh, not depending on in which institute you are. And so I think there was a big push for more collaboration also, which resonates again in all of those summaries. summaries. Uh, the last question that we tackled was kind of a summary question. It was about um, what people got out of this conference, uh, what are they most interesting about in this uh, big data era, and what are the big challenges that they see. And I think that machine learning was one of the big highlights, the fact that it is a tool that we can use to really harness all the data that we will have to do amazing discoveries. Um, but a lot of people actually said they didn't feel uh, prepared to use machine learning. So it's really a call to have um, learning capacities or to uh, uh, hire more, um, versed people in machine learning and to bring along different communities, uh, for example, the industry community, um, in order to be able to merge uh, observation people, for example, with uh, machine learning people and create uh, great things. And it was said that this conference was a great example because it really raises those questions and merge different type of people. Um, then a, ch a challenge was raised with how can we combine all those big data surveys uh, together, uh, for example, LSST with uh, Euclid or LSST with Roman, and discussion are ongoing, so it's a good news. <laughs> and finally, I think a question was raised about the computing capacity, because all of that machine learning, big data sets, will require a big computing capacity, and it's once again raised the question of equity, the institutes where we have uh, access first to those type of computing are the same that have a lot of um, follow-up power, for example. And so there may be a way to create a public uh, computing power place 
but once again, it's a difficult question, I think, uh, hard to answer. And we finished all the session by a reminder that it's great to be an astronomer in those big data era. Thank you very much. Great, great summary. And uh, I hear echoes of some of the same points made in other breakouts. Yeah.